Hi. Today's video is going to be about the temperature effects on the output of the Mitsubishi G71 diodes. There's been some discussion online that these diodes appear to have more temperature sensitivity than their big brothers, the P73s, and that the power output appears to drop uh, fairly significantly when they're run for a period of time, and that sounds to me like there's a temperature effect. Looking online, I can't find any evidence of anybody doing any kind of quantitative evaluation. And so building a new satellite projector and incorporating a quad module into it with these diodes, I thought it made sense before I went any further along to examine whether or not it, it would be worth it to do something more aggressive than a passive uh, thermal control. So I decided to take one of these diodes that I'd already set up in a uh, mount with one of the LSP two millimeter aspheric lenses already set and focused and test it in a um, temperature controlled apparatus that would allow me to evaluate the power output and even the wavelength change with temperature. The test setup I have over here is pretty straightforward. I have a circulating lab chiller that provides a pumped fluid flow uh, and a controlled temperature anywhere from minus 15 degrees centigrade up to 20 degrees centigrade. But in this case, I've got it set uh, for 15 degrees centigrade to act as a uh, thermal sink, uh, sort of an infinite thermal sink, against which the thermal electric cooling device can push against, either up or down. And the thermal electric cooler, which is mounted on top of this base plate, which contains the cooling liquid, is hooked up to a switching power supply. And as you see right here, the switching power supply has been wired in reverse because the first test I'm going to do here is going to be a warming test. So we're going to use the thermoelectric cooler as a heating element to heat the diode in this um, chamber here. The diode itself is driven by a FlexMod P3, which is then controlled by this power supply, such that at a full 5 volts of modulation, it's producing 1,200 milliwatts, or 1.2 amps of power to the diode. The diode is then contained inside of an insulated chamber on a uh, plate that is one centimeter thick, 10 centimeters wide, 15 centimeters long, and has been flattened on its base surface so that it makes good thermal contact with the thermoelectric cooler that's between the heat sink and the top base plate. Thermal grease was used on each surface, and also underneath the diode, which has then been screwed to the surface. The diode's output passes through a microscope slide, an uncoated microscope slide on the outer surface of the insulated chamber. And we lose about 10, a little more than 10% of the power output as it transfers through here. As a um, sort of a base number to start with, this thing produces 415 milliwatts on the power meter at 20 degrees centigrade and at 600 milliamps of input and it produces 460 milliwatts of output on this without the microscope slide there. So you can figure that every number you see here today is going to be about 10% less than if you had a good window with anti-reflection coating. On the back of this plate I've drilled a hole and run a thermistor to the fluke meter here. The fluke meter is then um, backed up by the Apollo, which has a small thermistor which has been taped with aluminum tape to the side of the diode mount at the height of the diode. These diodes are only going to use two or three watts of power, and this is a fairly robust connection, uh, stout, short, uh, pretty high thermal conductivity. So this is probably overkill in terms of thermal monitoring, but you will see through the test that these numbers will vary a little bit with the thermal gradients that occur when we do rapid heating and cooling, so eh, kind of interesting. The output of this then moves to the Ophir meter, which has been zeroed and which is set for the 650 nanometer wavelength range. And finally, I have a small portable monochromator here. Um, the way this is set up is rather than setting up a complicated spectrometer, um, you just do this visually. Uh, you look through one slit at a bright spot, such as the reflected light off the microscope slide. You dial the um, micrometer here, and the micrometer is set up such that one division equals one nanometer. I've calibrated this against a helium neon laser, which is fairly close in terms of the emission wavelength of the diode, so it's, it's pretty accurate. The reason I'm doing this is partly to look at if there's a color shift, but also because 
these diodes, the aluminum gallium arsenide diodes, um, have a published temperature shift of about 0.2 nanometers per degree centigrade. So by looking at the emission wavelength, I can estimate the junction temperature as opposed to just the bulk temperature that I'm measuring with the thermistors. Kind of a three-way measure of what's going on with the diode. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the power output of the diode at room temperature as a starting uh, to start. We'll start with one volt and that corresponds to 240 milliwatts or milliamps into the diode. And when I do that, you'll see that the power output is roughly 150 milliwatts. I'm going to set this now to 480 milliamps. And you can see the power is about 330 milliwatts. Now 720 milliamps, about 504 milliwatts. 960 milliamps, about 640 milliwatts. And finally, fully up at 1.2 amps and about 710 milliwatts. Now the interesting thing that I found with this is you can see the temperature hasn't changed much because we're not throwing a lot of heat in here and there's fairly good conductivity. But I've found that the knee or the slope begins to deteriorate after about one amp. I don't get much more power out of this. In addition, when I look at the wavelength with the monochromator, it has gone up about two nanometers from 637 to 639. And as a consequence, I'm assuming that the junction temperature is running about 10 degrees centigrade warmer than the bulk temperature of the heat sink. Now let's look at what happens if you heat this device. I'm gonna turn this down to something in the middle of its range. I'm gonna go down to 600 milliamps. And as you can see, the temperature tends to uh, still run around 18, 19, 20 degrees, and the output is around 415, 414 milliwatts. I'm gonna begin heating this. The reason I'm gonna heat it is because 18, 90 degrees centigrade is a cool room, and this is a fairly large heat sink for a single diode. And a typical projector in a warm room or a warm club where you've got uh, maybe a room temperature of 25, 26 degrees centigrade, and you're using that air to cool off the heat sinks or the projector that has a lot of additional heat being generated within it. You can imagine that the actual operating temperature of this diode is probably going to be closer to around 30 degrees centigrade on its plate. So as I heat this up, continue to watch what happens to the power output. Remember we're at about 416 milliwatts when we were using the same amount of power but the temperature was down around 20 degrees centigrade. And as you can see, the power continues to drop. Now there is a fair amount of thermal lag here and what I found is that if I go as fast as I am this has a bit of a catch-up period. It takes a little while for this and uh, this to equal the same number as the diode junction temperature indicates on the monochromator. But the trend is there and we'll continue to watch it for a little while. As the temperature continues to draw, as the temperature continues to rise. Now, in a poorly managed projector where you might not have a good heat sink or minimal fans or the room is very warm, I could I wouldn't be surprised if the junction temperature or the plate temperature could be as high as 35 degrees. And as you continue to rise here, you can see that the temperature clearly continues to affect the power output. The reason this is important is because if it hurts the power output so substantially by going up in temperature, you would suspect that there may be a benefit in lowering the temperature, and that's what I ended up finding. I'll continue to bring this up to, say, 35 degrees centigrade here, um, or somewhere in between, and as you can see, the power output just continues to drop. It doesn't stop. I didn't want to go too high because I think uh, I don't want to damage the diode. I'm not sure 
what would be a reasonable number for people to see in the worst case scenario, but 35 degrees centigrade, nearly body temperature, that's, that's probably about there. And by the time we're done here, we'll probably be down around 350 milliwatts. So keep this from getting too boring. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the power supply and I'm gonna change these leads over. And now we're gonna use the thermal electric cooler as a cooler. I'm gonna drop the temperature. Now what you'll notice is that there's gonna be a fair amount of uh, hysteresis here because there's a, there's a lot of thermal gradient. Uh, this temperature differential is gonna be pretty significant because uh, we're reversing the temperature of a warm plate and we've got a small diode and we've got a small mount. But if you go very, very slowly and allow the temperature to equalize, you'll find that as you just about hit 20 degrees centigrade, the power just about hits 415 milliwatts. And as you can see, as the temperature is dropping, the power is beginning to rise again. Now, once I get down to room temperature and slightly below, there is the chance that you're gonna to begin to develop some condensation on the cold surfaces, and I don't want that to happen. So what I've done is I've fabricated a little top here. It's got a little gasket. This is definitely not uh, a completed project. It's just a temporary seal, but it'll pretend, pretend, prevent humidity from depositing liquid on the surface. And right now you can see the temperature is probably somewhere between 20 to an 18 degrees centigrade, and the power has just about returned to its former number, and the temperature is gonna be continuing to drop. I'm just gonna turn the power up here a little bit so we can speed the process a little bit. Now in broadcasting, this would be considered dead air, but if you like these diodes, this is quietly exciting. This always does this to save power. You have to reboot it every five or 10 minutes. Now, because this may get a little bit dull, I'm gonna ask you to look away for just a second and I'm gonna show you what I plan to do with this. Because this turns out to be very successful, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna fabricate a small box that's gonna insulate and prevent humidity from depositing uh, condensation on the inner surfaces of the cold apparatus. So in a typical projector where you're building a quad module, you'll cut out a plate that will act as the base to which you're gonna screw down all your components. If this was an example of the plate that you are cutting down, what I would recommend doing is having a fairly robust material so that you've got good heat spread, good heat conductivity. Then I would go ahead and hone the bottom of this thing. And the way that you do that is you flatten the surface better than the mill material that comes out of the, out of the plant. And the way you do that is you will grind it on some sandpaper uh, for two or three minutes on maybe 100, 150 grit sandpaper until you see that pretty much the entire surface has been uh, ground to the same level of uh, reflectivity. It looks like it's all been touched then turn it at a 90 degree angle and go to a slightly finer sandpaper. I would recommend maybe 100, 200, and 400. When all of the scratches from one uh, motion axial have disappeared when the orthogonal has been ground on the next sandpaper, you know you've gotten down to the next level of smoothness. This will allow this to make much better contact with the very flat ground surface of the thermoelectric cooler. This then sandwiching between the base plate and the, um, the top plate with some pull down screws, typically using springs to reduce the thermal contact and also reduce the chance that you may over tighten and crack the chip. At the four corners will allow you to produce a fair amount of pressure and at the same time keep this from moving around. If you're still concerned about movement, you can always bore another set of holes near here and then just place a couple of pointed set screws that just kiss the bottom surface and act as cleats to keep this from moving around. You then fabricate a box that's a little bit bigger than this so that it doesn't touch the walls and will go all the way down to the surface of the projector plate. Using hold down screws that are drilled in the corners of these and a thick enough material, not like this box, but more like the apparatus that we used over there, if you have four screws protruding from the bottom, you can use them to retain a 
measured O-ring in a square pattern underneath the box, which will then be squeezed down to the plate. If you get soft and fairly compliant material, you can then run the leads of the diode right underneath the O-ring, and the pressure will cause them to seal the O-ring to seal not only the box, but also the leads. These, probably never ever gonna change them from the projector unlike these, probably better to just drill a hole within the box and plow them down through the floor in order to make uh, contact with the power supply. We wanna look back here and see what's happening. We're down to about zero degrees and we're up to 478 milliwatts. I'm gonna turn up the power here because this looks like it's pausing and it's holding down a little bit. Let's see if we can get this a little bit colder. I'm up to, as you can see on the power supply, about 80 watts. This is not a, a very efficient setup. I've got an oversized TEC, but nevertheless, it's got enough power that we could go very, very low with the temperature. I don't want to go so low that it's not typical of what's happening with uh, a practical projector. But interestingly enough, when you use the monochromator to look at what happens with the wavelength here, it does shift. It does go blue, but only about half as uh, much as you would expect from the temperature drop. So there appears to be a gradient that's, um, that exists between the diode junction temperature and the bulk temperature of the heat sink. So even though we talk about lowering the temperature of this thing 10, 20, 30 degrees centigrade, we're not talking about severe cryogenic-like temperatures at the junction. We're probably talking about temperature of ice. Uh, and so, therefore, I'm not too concerned that I'm going to be cracking epoxy or hurting coatings or doing something to solder joints. It's not that extreme. And as you can see, the cooling effect continues to increase the power output. We're now down to probably somewhere around minus 5 degrees centigrade, not much below freezing, and already we're nearly at 500 milliwatts. Again, I'm just pumping the power up so that we can end the... Uh, recording in a reasonable amount of time. But if you wait long enough, what I have found is that the uh, temperature just doesn't can stop rising. Uh, as you lower the temperature, it just keeps getting better. One thing that you do need to keep in mind is that if you build your box from something like plastic or lucite or something that has uh, fairly low thermal conductivity, the window that you have here will eventually become vulnerable to condensation because of the cool air inside behind it. If you use a little bit of aluminized tape to junction like I have to this surface down here, which is at room temperature, that will prevent the surface of the glass from getting too cold and causing some condensation. Alternatively, you could build your whole box out of aluminum if you wanted to. You don't need this so much for insulation. You just got to keep this, you got to keep the air off the cold plate and don't want to touch that cold plate with the inner surface of this material. Right now we're at 510 milliwatts and we're probably down around minus 14 degrees, something like that. Now that we're getting near the point where I think most of the projectors would work, let's see what kind of power we get if we go up to higher levels of uh, driving current. This is at 720 milliwatts or milliamps and we're getting about 630 628 milliwatts 960 and we got about 809 and finally all the way up at 1.2 amps and we're at about 900 nearly one watt and this is out of a P71, and I'm not really pushing the temperature beyond what should be reasonable. I have a suspicion that if we got this thing down stable at minus 20, uh, we probably could be running nearly a watt with 1.2 amps. The wavelength is only about two nanometers to the blue, so it hasn't changed its visibility. If anything, it's working in the right direction. Well, that's about it. So until next time, thanks for watching.